Tonight we're going to take a look at some of my favorite questions that relate to a Taylor series. Uh, but I think they're very, um, once we get them set up, they're pretty direct and snappy and don't take a ton of time. So maybe I guess that's why they're my favorite. But tonight we're going to take a look at how do I determine a specific derivative value if they just throw a Taylor polynomial at me. And by that I mean um, they're going to take the finished product of a Taylor polynomial, the, the one that we have spent you know, five or ten minutes building in the past, they're just going to give it to me and ask me to work backwards and see if I could figure out a specific derivative's value. And a lot of the times today, it's all going to come back to this. I'm going to ask myself, what would Taylor do? And if I can kind of set up the specific term from the Taylor series that I want, it's going to, things are going to fall into place. So let's jump in and take a look at an example. Let P of X be the fourth degree Taylor polynomial for a function of f up centered around x equals 0. So we'll say p sub 4 of x, and the first polynomial I'm going to throw at you is 6 minus 5x squared plus 3x to the fourth. Okay, so uh, pretend they've already, um, you know, built this Taylor polynomial from scratch. We don't know who f is, but they took four derivatives of f, they evaluated all four of those derivatives at zero, plugged them into the Taylor series, and this is what they came up with. Now my question to you is, what is the value of the fourth derivative of f at zero? Okay. Now notice I'm not exactly asking for the coefficient because if I just want to know, you know, what's the coefficient of the fourth degree term, well, you just look up here and you say, ah, it's a three. Um, but we're specifically asking you what's the value of the fourth derivative at zero. So what would Taylor do? Well, Taylor would say, hmm, if you want that term, it's going to be the fourth derivative evaluated at zero divided by four factorial times x to the fourth. That's what that term would look like, generically speaking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set that equal to the one that they gave me. They said this is the finished product. And maybe make a note of that right here in your notebook, that what we have up here is the finished product. And I'm going to set that equal to 3x to the fourth. Now something really special should happen every time we set these up. And it's the fact that I could divide both sides by x to the fourth and that these terms right there should cancel. So let's put that in our notebook here that... Um, the x to the force or x to the whatever they happen to be from problem to problem should cancel. If they don't cancel perfectly, like, um, I, I don't know, I'm thinking like if this was a 4 but that was a 5 and they don't cancel perfectly, then something's off. We set it up wrong, we grabbed the wrong term from the Taylor series, whatever the case might be. All right, scroll down just a little bit here. And um, so by the time I cancel those out, it should look like this. And all I'm going to do is multiply the 4 factorial to the other side. And boom, there it is. The fourth derivative evaluated at 0 is 3 times, uh, let's see, fact 4 factorial would be 24. And 3 times 24, 48, 60, how about 72? So there's your fourth derivative right there. Our next example is going to use the same Taylor polynomial, this p sub 4 of x function here, same, same terms. But I'm going to show you a neat connection to an earlier topic. And the first time I saw this question on an AP exam, I was really, really impressed with it. And it instantly became one of my favorites. Um, so the question is, does this particular f have a relative max, a relative min, or neither at x equals 0? Now here are some of the thoughts that instantly went through my head. Whenever we investigate maximums or minimums, we have a choice to make. Do we want to use the first derivative test, or do we want to use the second derivative test? Those are the two options floating through my mind right now. You know, and there's a lot of times throughout the year where you, you do have the freedom to pick whichever one you want and, um, you know, and run with it. And then there's other times during the year where we don't have enough information to run with one of them, and therefore we have, we have to use the other one by default. And this happens to be one of those cases because here's what's happening. If you wanted to use um, the first derivative test and you think zero is a critical point, you would then have to pick something like negative one. And who do you plug it into? You plug it into f prime. Well, we don't know what the function 
f prime, you know, who it is, you know, so we don't have anything to plug the negative one into, and, you know, and vice versa, we pick, you know, something like one to ch test the other side of the zero, and, and again, we don't have f prime, so we don't know what to plug the one into, so what we have to do is we have to scrap that first derivative test, unfortunately, and, and that's bad news, because that's the one that I think 99% of us are more comfortable with. So what I'm going to do is, that just a real quick recap of the second derivative test, there's three possible scenarios. One um, the function's concave up with a horizontal tangent line, which means, so here's what's happening, is you've got your f prime is equal to zero, your f double prime is greater than zero, and you've got a relative min. Okay, Case number two might look something like this. And what you've got here is you've got, again, f prime is equal to zero because of the horizontal tangent line, but now this time the second derivative is less than zero, and now we've proven a relative max. And then the third case that we don't run into too often, but it could exist, is this case right here. There should be a horizontal tangent line right there. You've got your f prime equal to zero, just like the other cases, but what's happening at that critical point, kind of like what's happening on x cubed at the origin, is that your second derivative is also equal to zero, and so we've proven that there's neither a max nor a min there. Okay, so let's take a look at this polynomial and what we know just by looking at it. See if you agree with this. Could I rewrite p sub 4 of x like this. True or false, this is a legal move. 6 minus 0x minus, or I could say plus 0x at that, you know. 5x squared, um, let's say plus 0x cubed plus 3x to the fourth. True or false, is that legal? Hopefully, you're sitting there thinking, yeah, that's legal. I'm still equivalent to the polynomial that was written above on the higher screen there. So here's what's happening. Again, what would Taylor do? Because I, really what I want to do is I want to find f prime of 0. Okay? And I also want to find f double prime of 0. And if I knew the value of those two derivatives, then I'd be really ready to make an argument as to whether there's a max, min, or neither at x equals 0. So, what would Taylor do? Well, Taylor says the first term is always going to be f prime of 0 times x, okay? And it's not divided, well, I guess technically it is divided by 1 factorial. And I'm going to set that equal to this term right here, because now the x is cancel, and I've proven f prime of 0 equals 0. So I've got a horizontal tangent line at least, if nothing else. Okay, again, let's go find the second derivative. What would Taylor do? He says, well, the second derivative is going to be divided by 2 factorial, and that's multiplied by the x squared. So I'm going to set that equal to the given term up here, the negative 5x squared. Again, what should happen if I set it up correctly? We've got to see these x squareds canceled. So by the time I multiply the 2 factorial over there, I've proven that the second derivative evaluated as 0 is equal to negative 10, and therefore f's concave down. And if I marry these two things together simultaneously, I have proven the existence of a relative max, and that's according to the second derivative test. So I hope you like that question. That was one of my favorite ones. Okay, so I want you to try this one on your own once I get done setting up, uh, kind of setting the table, so to speak, and, and, and giving you the directions. So I want you to assume that there's this mysterious function known as f, and that they set out to write the 6 degree Taylor polynomial centered at 1. So what they did is they calculated the first 6 derivatives, they plugged in the appropriate values, and this is the finished product that they came up with. So again, I think it's helpful to think of this polynomial as the finished product. Now, if we wanted to work backwards, here are my two questions for you. Number one, can you find the value of, I want to know the fourth derivative evaluated as zero, okay? In question number two, I want to know the fifth derivative um, evaluated as zero. And I guess I, I just noticed I wasn't using Roman numerals. Um, the AP does go back and forth on that. Like sometimes this superscript will be um, the Roman numeral four or the Roman numeral five, or sometimes they just write uh, the regular number that we're more accustomed to. So go ahead, right now, hit that pause button and see if you can calculate the value of those um, unknown derivatives. And then we'll compare notes and see if we're on the same page. 
All right, welcome back. The first one I'm going to try to tackle is this fourth derivative. And what you'll notice right here in this vicinity right here is that, you know, this is where we would expect that fourth degree term to come from, but it's missing. There's nothing there as far as a fourth degree term comes from. So basically what it means is that coefficient was a zero, and that's what may basically made it vanish or disappear completely. But regardless, this is how I would set it up in my mind. So I'm thinking, what would Taylor do? first and foremost. Now Taylor would say, well, the fourth derivative has to be divided by the fourth factorial, and if it's centered at one, that quantity needs to be raised to the fourth power. And I'm going to set it equal to what I see, and I see nothing, so I'm saying I'm saying zero times x minus one to the fourth. Now again, I'm expecting these quantities to cancel every single time where I know I set it up incorrectly. And then once I cross multiply, I'm getting the fourth derivative to just simply be zero. So that was a little bit of anticlimactic, I guess. Um, now let's go tackle the fifth derivative. This one promises to be a little more intriguing. So what does, what would Taylor do? You know what? I gotta change. I don't like that pen color. Let's see if I can find something a little darker, maybe here. Um, yeah, that looks good. Okay. So Taylor says, well, you'd start off with the fifth derivative, evaluate at zero. What would you divide it by? Yeah. The 5 factorial. And then you'd also see the x minus 1 raised to the 5th. So that's what Taylor would do. And I'm going to set that equal to what I have been given as a finished product here. And what should cancel if we set this up correctly? Yeah, these quantities right there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cross multiply. And it looks like the 5th derivative evaluated at 0 is simply 6 times 5 factorial. And I believe that 5 factorial is 120. So 6 times 120 uh, I'm feeling 720 myself. This next example is considerably harder than any of the ones we've done up to this point. This one's going to be significantly more challenging, but it's going to be right on spot uh, with what we're going to expect to see on the AP exam. So what do we got cooking here? We've got a Taylor polynomial of degree 90. Okay, a little obnoxious, but we'll work with it. And what they've done here, they showed us the first three terms, dot, dot, dot. They gave us the general term, and then they finished it off, and they showed us the very last term, or the 90th degree term. And, uh, of course, that, that general term is going to be really important because that could help you build any other term between the 9th or the 90th term that they happen to ask us for. So, you know, take your time, hit that pause button, whatever it takes, get this all copied down and, and you know, um, and hopefully it looks a lot neater in your notebook than what it does on the screen. I was trying to squeeze it in. Okay. Now, my question to you, what is, whoops, grab the pen. There we go. What is the value of the 30th derivative evaluated at 2? Okay. Okay. So here's how I'm going to set it up. First things first. Again, and it all goes back to, you know, what would Taylor do? Taylor's telling me, and, and first of all, I'll start off generically, it's always going to be the nth derivative, in this case, evaluated at 2 divided by n factorial, quantity x minus 2 to the nth. Now, I specifically, I want the 30th one, so I'm going to say, okay, 30th derivative, evaluated at 2, divided by who? 30 factorial. And then we're going to see x minus 2 being raised to the what? Yeah, the 30th power. So those are all guarantees. The fact that you should have these three 30s on your paper, they all should correspond and match perfectly. Now, what am I going to set it equal to? The first thing is I'm going to grab the general term right here, and I'm going to import that. And I'm just going to say we've got negative 1 to the n minus 1. We've got x minus 2 to the 3n power. And we've also got 2n quantity factorial. Now remember how we kept stressing throughout the video tonight that certain things have to cancel, they're guaranteed to cancel, and if they don't cancel, we've set it up incorrectly? Well, that's what I want to get at here. What should be canceling? Do you agree that this quantity right here should be canceling with this quantity? In other words, the quantity that possesses the x should cancel out. The only way that these are going to cancel is if I let n equal blank. And what do you think that is? Let's let n equal a 10. Because if, if I let a, n equal 10, then that's going to force this to be a 30, right? And as long as that's a 30, then we're going to get those bears to cancel. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we've got the 30th derivative evaluated at 2 divided by 30 factorial x minus 2 to the 30th power equals. All right, start substituting your 10. 10 minus 1 is 9. That's going to be negative something. 
x minus 2 to the 30th, and let's see, 20 factorial. Okay, so here's the happy news. Bang, bang, get those bears out of there. And we'll just rewrite it to try to clean it up. And let's see. That's going to equal negative 1. Don't lose that negative. Don't lose that negative. Okay. Then we're just going to multiply the 30 factorial to the other side. And my final answer, and I don't definitely don't have to clean this up, is going to be negative 30 factorial over 20 factorial. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the value of the 30th derivative evaluated at 2. Uh, for the last uh, to t a couple slides on the video, we're going to switch gears here, and uh, it's not necessarily directly related to the stuff we've been doing up to now. My big question is, how do we handle something like a minus 1? And, and specifically, if I was like, let's think of this g of x function here, and maybe they wanted me to build a Taylor series for this function g of x, and, and I just want to know, I think it's, we've seen it two or three times already, and it, it's really caused us a lot of frustration, so I'm hoping to clarify it tonight here in this video. And before I really dive uh, wholeheartedly into g of x, I want to just take a look here at this blue question. How would you simplify this expression here? You know, let's jump in our time machine and go back to algebra one here and think about how we would simplify this term. And I, ho I hope you're kind of laughing at this a little bit, thinking, you know, why, why are you wasting my time with such a simple problem? But really, the question is that I want to get to and I want to boil it down. Do you take this negative six and distribute it to all three terms? I hope the answer is a very emphatic no, okay? And what I would say here is at this stage of the game, these parentheses are quite unnecessary. You could literally, you know, we could literally drop them. And all it is, is all we're going to do is combine like terms, right? And so what's happening is we're not distributing that 6. And, and really all it is, is when I combine like terms, those terms cancel. One time deal, boom, boom, 6s are dead. And then I'm going to take the remaining terms and I'm going to divide them each by the x that's underneath. And so the first term becomes a 4 and the second term becomes a 5x and that would be the simplified answer. So let's go back now. Let's take a look at that g of x function and ask ourselves how we would handle this one. So g of x said, I want you to take e to the x cubed, subtract 1, and then divide it all by x, I believe, or x squared. I'll have to go back and double check. No, it was just an x. Okay, so I scribbled out my x squared. So first things first. Uh, the first thing that I would do is, and this is definitely a multi-step problem, is I just want to focus on can I build e to the x cubed. Um, and I probably should have specified that this one is centered at x equals 0. It is a Maclaurin, so we could use the big 4. And so step 1 in your mind, ask yourself, can I build e to the x cubed relatively you know, easily? And so I'm thinking, well, I know what e to the x is. 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus uh, dot 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 plus x to the n over n factorial plus dot dot dot. And so when I do e to the x cubed, I'm substituting here. This is the time where I am substituting an x cubed in for all the x's. So this is x cubed raised to the second, which turns into x to the six plus dot dot dot. And then we'll go x to the three n over n factorial plus dot dot dot. So here's what's going to happen. Now that I've built e to the x cubed, I'm going to take this polynomial right here and I'm going to substitute it, if you can follow my arrow, in for that e to the x cubed right there. So step number two, we're going to import that function. And um, so I've got my 1 plus my x cubed plus my x to the 6 over 2 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. And I've got to get the general term in here. Close that parenthesis. And what comes after the parenthesis? It's going to be that minus 1 that was chilling out there. And then we've got to divide the whole thing by x. All right, now how would you simplify this expression? Would you distribute the minus 1? Okay, and that maybe, maybe that question's worth writing down in your notebook. Would you? And hopefully, again, you're saying definitely not. It's just all I'm going to do is I could literally erase those parentheses right now. I'm going to combine like terms. And the moment that I combine my like terms, this one's going to cancel with that one. It's a one-time deal. Bang, bang, they're both gone. So now I'm going to take, once those cancel, I'm going to take the remaining terms 
And now that I canceled the first term, I've kind of got to project what the next term would be, and that would be x to the ninth divided by 3 factorial plus dot, 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 um, x to the 3n divided by n factorial. And I'm going to divide that bear by x. So I'm going to go term by term. First term here turns into x squared. The second term, I'm subtracting 1 from the exponent when I divide. The third term is going to become x to the 8th divided by 3 factorial. And that last term will be x to the 3n minus 1 over n factorial, okay? So that's what it would look like. And I just want to talk about how we're not distributing that minus 1. We're just combining like terms. One time deal, done. All right, so let's see if we can put that into practice here. And I'm going to have you finish this on your own. Hopefully it just takes two more minutes here tonight before you can call it a night and kill the lights. Um, I want you to try to write the first three non-zero terms and the general term for this function h here. And, and first of all, maybe it's worth asking this question, what are you taking the sign of? You know, um, And really what's happening here is if there's no parentheses, the rule is you're only taking the sign of of the first term. So um, in other words, there would be an invisible set right here. And your task is to import a Taylor series, uh, more specifically a Maclaurin series. We'll say it's centered at zero. You're going to import that right into here for sine of x. And then you're going to be able to subtract the x, combine like terms, divide everything by x squared, and see what your finished product is, OK? So good luck cleaning that one up tonight. And hopefully, we'll be able to put this uh, little hiccup be behind us. All right, looking forward to it. See you tomorrow.